Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. I am so glad that you're here of the many choices you had for your first afternoon session. Thank you for choosing this particular session and I'm honored by your presence today. Uh, just a few housekeeping details. I know it's after lunch, so if, if you're tired and you are, if you do snore, I just ask the person next to you to wake you up. If you, if you do have to attend to your biology at any time during this presentation, feel free to just leave. I won't take it as any kind of a protest sign, at least not at first. And um, my phone will go off, just so you know, at 2.15, just to either remind me that it's time to get the train back on track or to let me know that the train is ready for the station. Also, this tape here is sticking to the bottom of my feet, so if I go one way and my body goes another way, you'll know that too. And um, I am just so excited to be with all of you today, and, and thank you so much for being here. I um, will be taking my glasses off and on because I got new ones and the prescription doesn't quite fit, so I hope that's not a terrible distraction for you. But nevertheless, I, here we are, and the topic for today is Eucharist, a mystery you can't swallow whole. And uh, the one other thing I just wanted to mention, I, I'm kind of a teacher at heart, so I need to be moving around, but I know for the purposes of our camera and the like, I'd like me to stay pretty much connected to this podium. So I might wander around a little bit. I would just feel much more comfortable being with you and among you, but you know, we do what we have to do. And to all of our digital viewers who are viewing this in the future, thank you too for joining us today and know that our prayers and yours are also timeless and retroactive. And we're with you as well as, as you're with us. Well. Uh, we'll be, I just formally just want to again welcome you and just by way of a brief introduction, my name is Father Kevin Scalf. I've been a priest of the Missionaries of the Precious Blood uh, for 15 years last Thursday uh, on the Feast of St. Anthony and that was the day after my birthday. So I always said that, you know, uh, 15 years ago, the day after my birthday was one of the greatest gifts that God could have given me, the greatest birthday gifts at that time and just a wonderful gift and a wonderful blessing it has been ever since. And so I've been affiliated with the Missionaries of the Precious Blood uh, for about 20 years in different, uh, in different relationships, in different stages of formation and the like. Most uh, the passion that God has given me has been in education, Catholic education, high schools, colleges, teaching, administration, all points in between, and also giving talks at parishes and retreats and missions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my current ministry is at Archbishop McNicholas High School. McNicholas High School, or McNick as it's often abbreviated in Cincinnati, is uh, the first co-ed Catholic high school in the Archdiocese, founded in 1951. Uh, we have about uh, almost 700 students now. We've seen a, a precipitous uptick of students in the last three years. And um, I think about it, it is now 87% of our families identify as Catholic, which is certainly an anomaly, it's an outlier. I teach about two to three sections each semester of theology to juniors, and then um, I also serve the sacramental needs of the school as chaplain. And it is just a great gift and a blessing to, to be with this community, that community, this community. Uh, but I can predictably say that there are three sad times throughout every academic year. It's when the first semester ends and then the second semester ends because I have to say goodbye to these tremendous young women and men. Uh, even though they'll be seniors, it's in a much different capacity. And then the third sad point is when our seniors graduate, and many of them just did that today. Uh, because unless they come, or they just graduated the other day, but you know, unless they come back and visit, you would usually only see them maybe at, a, at an athletic event or at a gas pump. You know, that's just kind of how it is. In addition to my role at McNicholas High School, which is my full-time ministry, uh, I am also executive director for mission advancement for the missionaries of the precious blood, the United States province. I have the distinct pleasure of working with Kara Keller, who's sitting here now, and, uh, and, and, and very grateful to Mark Isagi for all of his many years of leading this mission effort uh, with the CPPS, and, and, and thank you. Fortunately, even though you've retired in one way, you're continuing in another way, and so Mark, very grateful to you for all of that, and Cindy for all the ways you help us here, there, and everywhere. And then I reside at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter Ch in Chains in downtown Cincinnati. I also assist there with weekday masses and weekend masses. Um, a little curious fact, a factoid, is that the Cathedral Basilica is the oldest continuously operating basilica cathedral in the United States. Now there are certainly older cathedral basilicas, but they've either had starts and stops over the years for any number of reasons. Uh, St. Peter in Chains has been ongoing. So uh, that's just a, a little about me. I'm an only child, my mom's an only child, my dad 
his family is in another state. So I moved back to Cincinnati about three years ago to be closer to my family. They're fine, but I wanted to be back when things were good rather than when things are bad. So it is good to be close to family and not too far from my other family, my precious blood family. And that's certainly what we all are here today. Now, I always begin my courses, each class, every class with what I call holy humor. Holy humor. And effectively, it's about four to five just awful dad jokes. And I find it's important for doing a number of things. One, it breaks the ice. Number two, it gets us thinking creatively. Three, it's healing to laugh together. Um, and it's just good to be miserable together sometimes. So just I'll, I'll prime the pump with just one of these kind of, when, when does a joke become a dad joke? Does anyone know when a joke becomes a dad joke? Yes, when it's a parent. Good job. <laughs> Check. Now, now if, if you were one of my, my students, you would be rewarded for the, every correct answer. You just don't get any sticker, not just in my class. You do get a sticker, but it's a scratch and sniff sticker. And they fight for these stickers. It's amazing. They, they put them on their laptops. They put them on their water bottles. They put them on their shirts, their sweaters. It's, it's kind of a crazy thing, but they do it. Well, I want to start this presentation not necessarily with some an additional form of awful, holy humor dad jokes, but with a little bit of a joke of another kind. So, are you ready? Okay, good. All right. A man had a few too many drinks and stumbled across a baptism one Sunday afternoon not too far from here near the, the local river. What is that, the Mississippi? Yeah. So he proceeded to stumble into the water and stand next to the local Protestant minister. The minister turned and noticed the man and said, Mister, are you ready to find Jesus? Oh, the man looked back and said, Yes, sir, I am. Well, the minister dunked him under the water and pulled him back up and said, Have you found Jesus? No, I did not, said the man. Well, the minister dunked him again and brought him up and asked, Now, brother, this time, have you found Jesus? The man said, No, sir, I have not. Well, disgruntled and disgusted and frustrated, the minister repeated the dunking and brought him up and said, Now, for the love of God and all that's holy, have you found Jesus this time? Well, the man wiped his eyes and said, No, sir, I have not. But are you sure this is where he fell in? Where do they find these priests, really? I mean, you know. Well, we find Jesus in some obvious places and some not so obvious places. How's that for a transition? For us Catholics, one of the more obvious places that we find the real presence of Christ is at Mass. And our liturgy documents of Vatican II talk about four loci or four centers or four places where we encounter that wonderful real presence of Christ. The first place is in the readings in sacred scripture, in the people, in the priest and uniquely in the Eucharist, in the body and blood of Christ. And the church, in her wisdom, knows that there's something very powerful about the Eucharist, and so have so many of the other powerful, holy, saintly women and men throughout our tradition that have dedicated their, so their lives, their charism, and their writings to a kind of Eucharistic spirituality. And of course, we know that St. Gaspar was one of those persons who really was one committed to reconciliation, healing, and renewal in the lives of the faithful and in the lives of the church. We see him committed to that mission with that mission cross, and uh, we are a Eucharistic congregation. There is no doubt about it, and I think if Gasper were alive today, if he were, were right here with us, I know he's with us in spirit, he would be very enthusiastic about the Eucharistic Congress, the Eucharistic renewal that is a very much a part of our church today. And, and I say he would be enthusiastic in the most classical sense of the word enthusiasm, which is, of course, a confluence of two Greek words, en theos, in, 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 literally enthusiastic is God-filled. And I think he would be at his just entirely enthusiastic about what the church is doing right now. And so it's three years. We're in year two of a three-year Eucharistic revival. The mission phase is next year, 2025. And there's, of course, a huge celebration and prayer around the Eucharist in just a few weeks in Indianapolis at Lucas Oil Stadium. And so we're, we want to keep all those persons, those pilgrims, many of them are young people who will be at Lucas Oil Stadium at, uh, in Indianapolis in just a few weeks as part of our Euchar National Eucharistic 
revival. I think it's important just to kind of lay some of the foundations and review some of the things that we know. Uh, the first thing is that Jesus gives himself to us in the Eucharist because he loves us. All that we're going to encounter this week here in St. Louis, all that we believe and pray in the church is all pertaining to God's love. God is love. And it's always a love that is invited. As Father Ed Foley talked about the importance of hospitality and welcome, that's an extension and expression where hearts meet hearts and things happen. Cor ad cor loquitor, where hearts are meeting hearts and lives are being changed because it's the love of God that makes it all possible. And so when we think about then the Mass, I often begin Mass after the sign of the cross. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit, I will often say, welcome. Welcome to this great sacrament of God's love, because that is precisely what we celebrate at every Mass and every Eucharist, is a celebration of God's love. So I think that's really one of the first tenets of what we believe. By receiving his body and blood, we're united to him. In the Eucharist, we receive the real presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And this is effectively a lifelong process of any number of terms, a journey, a conversion, an ongoing relationship, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we believe. And the sources for this, oh, I should point out that, that I'm going to be using some primary sources for what follows. And you're going to notice that uh, some of these sources have been abbreviated, either with an underline or an italic or a highlight or a color change to the text. Those are my changes to the text. Those are not in the original document. So what are the sources for these beliefs that we hold about the Eucharist, uh, the body and the blood? Well, it comes from Revelation. For Catholics, how does God reveal God's self? How is God's love made known? One source, two expressions. One source, two expressions. Uh, through scripture and tradition. So what does scripture say then about this sacrament that we hold so dear? Well, in the fourth gospel, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise them on the last day. So notice here, there's an implicit focus on body and blood together. This is important for where I'm, I'm going to be going in just a moment, but body and blood together, providing life here and life to come. There's no separation, there's no pause, there are no ellipses, there are no dashes, there's not, these are inseparable realities according to the fourth gospel, Jesus of the fourth gospel, body, blood, together, scripture. Now, we also have something from our tradition, namely in 1551 from the Council of Trent that articulates this in a, in a new way, a different way. The whole Christ is contained under each form but reception of the Eucharist in both kinds is a more perfect partaking. Christ, who is the norm for all liturgical actions, offered both forms. So too then, every Mass always includes both. A more perfect partaking. Some have said, well, if, if the perfect expression of God in the Eucharist is in, you know, in, in the body and the blood, why do I need to take the precious blood? Why should I receive the precious blood? And that's a really good question. And, and just kind of more of an of a anecdote to respond to that, I've been giving this some thought. And at least to my way of thinking, I think it's a fuller sign of the mystery we celebrate, a fuller sign of the mystery of God's love for you, for me, for us as church, a fuller sign of that reality, a greater sign of the celebration of God's love that is the reason for our being and our being together. It's also a heightened experience of sacrifice, covenant, unity, and sacred celebration. Some will ask, do I have to receive the cup as if it's some kind of an onerous burden? No, but do you really realize what you're missing? and not receiving the cup. Because again, as Jesus said, both are really, really important. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes in my experience in our wonderful Catholic tradition, uh, I experience separation anxiety. And in the past couple years since the the uh, Eucharistic Congress began, there's been a wonderful influx of articles and podcasts and uh, videos and uh, you name it written about the Eucharist. Wonderful. But I don't know about you, but I often find that the content and the direction of these materials is very um, body-centric. 
It, it's very host-centric. A lot about the body of Christ. Fine, wonderful, but I'm also wondering, where's the blood? Where's the blood of Christ? Something's missing. And at the same time, I often find in our precious blood world, it's just the opposite. And perhaps as a necessary correction to that, we hear so much about the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Jesus, I'm often wondering, where's the body? Because I've come to appreciate that a precious blood spirituality is a spirituality of, of, of integrity, of integration, of synthesis, of unity, and reconciliation. And if we go back to the, sort, the scripture and tradition, both have to be those necessary conversation partners to help us to experience the fullness of God's love to the degree we can experience the fullness of God's love in whatever season of our lives we find ourselves. So this particular presentation is going to take that seriously, that both the body and the blood are inexorable. They're not bifurcated, separated, distanced. They've got to be together. Uh, St. Pope John Paul II defined faith and reason. He said, you know, faith and reason are like two wings in which truth rises to the ascent of the heavens. I think that could be edited a bit to say that the body and blood of Christ together are the two wings upon which the body of Christ ascends into the great mystery of God's love together. So we may not have it all together, but together we have it all. All right, now to kind of explicate this a little bit more, I'm going to just offer three stories and three meditations. Three stories, three meditations. And the first story uh, focuses on my first communion. And uh, raise your hand if you can remember your first communion. Raise your hand. Yeah, look around. Okay, good. Put your hands down. First grade, we had a first communion retreat. You know how you have like confirmation retreats? Well, we had a first communion retreat at Our Lady of Victory grade school on the west side of Cincinnati. And I remember the sisters of Oldenburg, the Oldenburg Franciscan sisters were at the school for a long time. When I was there, there was maybe one or two there. And our principal was a Benedictine nun from Northern Kentucky, St. Wahlberg Monastery. And so Sister Rita, our principal, who's still alive, God love her, I think she's about 103, but a young 103, uh, invited one of her sister sisters to give us a talk on um, First Communion. Her name was Sister Martha. I got to know Sister Martha later in life. Uh, she's since passed. But I remember Sister Martha, at least in front of us students, was a very, very stern sister, a very serious sister. And maybe you had to be that way when you had a room full of, you know, 100 first graders, it probably was necessary. And, and she said, uh, children, you are being prepared for the most important day of your life. Because at your first communion, you are going to meet the bridegroom of your soul. And she said, it is an important day, and you can blow it if you commit a mortal sin, by allowing the host to touch your teeth and to chew it. So therefore, dear children, you must swallow it whole. Well, I thought, how do you swallow it whole? The first grade Kevin was wondering. So I raised my hand and I said, Sister Martha, how do you swallow it whole? And we had name tags. So she said, Stauf, come up here. So I did. I walked up and stood right in front of her. And she was a very tall woman. And she said, look into my mouth. And I, I looked up and, oh my God, it was this, this dangly uvula. I, I didn't know she could swallow anything with that. I still remember it to this day. And she said, here's how you do it. I'm going to demonstrate. And we're all looking. The boys and girls are just wrapped. And she said, you take the host and you put it on the roof of your mouth and you take the tip of your tongue and you curl it. And then you swallow it whole. Okay. All right. That's how you do it. So we fast forward then to First Communion. 
powerful day. The girls are all dressed up. The boys are all dressed up. Girls on one side, boys on the other side, right in between our parents. And during the consecration, Father Strittmatter, our pastor, you know, did this elevate, said, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in memory of me. But, but when he said, this is my body, I remember he then elevated that host. And I looked at that thing, and I nudged my dad. I said, Dad? How am I going to swallow that one whole? <laughs> How do you swallow that whole? I can't swallow that whole. I'll never forget that as long as I live, because that is theologically correct. For the mystery of Christ's presence, the mystery that fills the universe in all of its parts, the mystery of the divine presence that has been given up to us in Christ, the God who 14.8 billion years ago desired of God in Christ is the desire of all of us to participate in a mystery of love that we will never, ever be able to swallow whole. Ever. Even St. Thomas Aquinas, the great Eucharistic theologian in his Summa, knew this. And he began to think about the word mystery, and he came up with something like this. And he said, and this is a paraphrase, mystery, he said, is not something incomprehensible. It's not like it's a mystery to me. But the more, the more he pushes this, he says that the more we understand, the more we understand how much more there is to understand that we will never actually understand. Because this mystery is God's desire for us first. That from the very beginning, God ultimately desired each of us first. That's why out of God's love, God created us out of a deep desire that God had for us first. It's a mystery that the more we savor it, the more we understand how indescribably delicious it really is. Because we can never say, I got it. Because once we say, I got it, to the divine mystery, we are falling into the great sin of idolatry. Once we say, I got it, I understand it, finally, to the divine mystery, we're falling into the great sin of idolatry. And that's why at every Eucharist, the priest will declare, Mysterium Fidei, Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of faith, something that is infinitely comprehensible. The more we understand, the more we understand how much more infinitely there is to understand. In a recent document, Pope Francis, uh, Desiderio Desideravi, Desiderio Desideravi, it roughly translates a deep desire, an honest desire, a sincere desire, referring to the great initial desire that God has for us always, a deep desire that brought each of us into existence and holds us into existence as members of the body of Christ today. In the document, Desiderio Desideravi, which was about the formation of Catholics and the celebration of the Eucharist, he says this in paragraph 6 about mystery and desire. Pope Francis speaks. Before our response to Christ's invitation, well before, there is Christ's desire for us. We may not even be aware of it, but every time we go to Mass, the first reason is that we are drawn there by his desire for us. For our part, the possible response, which is also the most demanding asceticism, is always that surrender to Christ's love, that letting ourselves be drawn to Christ is most important. And I'd like to just pause by saying that it is important, it can be a challenge to allow ourselves and our deep vulnerability to be loved by God, 
to surrender to that divine abandonment, to really allow ourselves to be loved by the desire with a capital D that desired us before we even knew what it meant to desire anything else, to know deeply within our hearts that God did not want a world in which you weren't here. You are here for a very special reason. God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make mistakes. You are here because God wants you here out of that love. And in the surrender to that love, to allow ourselves and our capacity to love, to be loved even more by the God of endless love. I think that's what Francis is getting at. He talks about that desire of God's love. Indeed, every reception of communion, and this is powerful, powerful. This is one of those powerful lines in this document. Indeed, every reception of communion of the body and blood of Christ was already desired by Christ at the Last Supper and from all eternity. Now you think about that. Every time we receive communion, the body and blood of Christ was desired by Jesus ever since the Last Supper. And as soon as we think that over 20 centuries ago that some things have diminished over time, maybe the power of God's grace has diminished. That was the Last Supper. Got to be better then. Lots happened between now and then, but it's the same grace, the same love, the same transformational vortex of God's love and mercy that was present at the Last Supper is present at every single Mass that we are part of and every reception of communion that we take. God desired it from the beginning, and how powerful is that? So Pope Francis speaks, and this is the mystery that we can't swallow whole. It's the mystery of Jesus Christ that stands at the center of the whole cosmos. Saint Pope John Paul II, in another document called Mane Nobiscum Domini, which kind of roughly translates, Stay with us, O Lord, which he writes the October before he dies. Um, he says in paragraph 6, I think, nope, nope, well, it's on the big screen, that's all that matters. The mystery we cannot understand, there it is. Jesus Christ stands at the center not just of the history of the church, but also the history of humanity. And in Christ, all things are drawn together. How could we forget the enthusiasm with which the Second Vatican Council, quoting Pope Paul VI, proclaimed that Christ is, quote, the goal of human history, the focal point of the desire of history and civilization, the center of all humankind, the joy of all hearts, and the fulfillment of all aspirations. When I was a first grader, little did I know that this was going to be the most important day of my life, when I would take Holy Communion for the first time. That this repeatable sacrament of initiation, which it is, by the way, the Eucharist is the repeatable sacrament of initiation, in which we are reinitiated into the body of Christ, because we need to be regularly reinitiated into the body of Christ by the body and blood of Christ. I never knew that that would initiate me more deeply into the Christ who fills the universe in all of its parts. The mystery of the cosmic Christ, of the divine presence that we know and appreciate in the Eucharistic gift that we share. We who share in that gift are initiated more and more into that mystery until we eventually become the body of Christ. Because in speaking uh, of the Eucharist, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, mentioned that when we talk about the body of Christ, we're really talking about three things. And it's important, I think, to note this. The body of Christ first refers to the resurrected body of Christ that's now in glory for all eternity. It also refers to the Eucharistic species, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ reserved for the sick and our adoration and prayer. And thirdly, the church. And as we Read beautifully in, in, in the Vatican II document on the church, the church is not a building, it's the people of God. The church is the people of God. Uh, the place where we do it is the worship space, but admittedly it sounds a little odd just to say, come on, honey, let's grab the kids, we're going to the worship space today. Got it. 
But these are the three meanings of church that are important to note as we consider what it means to be church as a Eucharistic people. And so Aquinas plays off of Augustine, or Augustine plays off of Aquinas. The mystery that we cannot swallow whole is the mystery that really then, folks, swallows us whole. For Christ takes us into his body, and we in turn become the body of Christ until there will become one Christ loving himself. Significantly, the Synod Fathers stated that the Christian faithful needed a fuller understanding of the relationship between the Eucharist and their daily lives. Eucharistic spirituality is not just participation in the Mass and devotion of the Blessed Sacrament. It embraces a whole way of life. And as Father Foley is going to discuss next, devotions are important, but it can't just be me and Jesus, because if we're talking about Christ, it's got to lead us to something beyond the prayer. Mission for something, mission for someone made. We are made for mission. Continuing, today, there is a need to rediscover that Jesus Christ is not just a private conviction or an abstract idea, but a real person. And I find in teaching teenagers, mostly teenagers, I find that this is one of the greatest challenges that I face is helping them to move from a place of, or, or a, a shift in a relationship between God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit as a good concept, a great idea, but a living person, the second person of the Trinity, part of the one God living and true, and how to develop that relationship, which, which is what the Holy Father is speaking about here, is, it's, it's, that it's personal relationship is enormously important, but it can't just stop in the relationship. That then has to affect all of the dimensions of one's life, wherever one finds oneself. And so, so this is, I think, enormously important that, that, that Jesus Christ is not just a private conviction, not an abstract idea, but a real person who's becoming part of human history is capable of renewing the life of every man and woman Hence, the Eucharist, as the source and the summit of the church's life and mission, must be translated into a spirituality, into a life lived according to the Spirit. In my homily at the Eucharistic celebration, solemnly inaugurating my Petrine ministry, he said, I said, there is nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel to be surprised by an encounter with Christ, and Pope Francis talks so much, I'm going to get back to this, about allowing ourselves not just to be loved by God anew, but to be astonished, to be bedazzled by being overwhelmed by the mystery of God that confronts us in word and sacrament and in all of creation. The sense of surprise, amazement, bedazzlement at the heart of all of creation. So it's picked up even here, to be surprised by all this. There is nothing more beautiful than to know Christ and to speak to others of our friendship with Christ. These words are all the more significant if we think of the mystery of the Eucharist. The love that we celebrate in the sacrament is not something we can keep to ourselves because if it's authentic love, it can't be kept to ourselves. It must be shared with others. By its nature, it demands to be shared with all. What the world needs is God's love. It needs to encounter Christ and to believe in him, not as an abstract idea or some kind of a good theory, but as a real person living in true. And this, by the way, also gets at what Pope Francis has been advancing for, for a little while now about missionary discipleship, that as we as a church move from maintenance to mission, we move from being members, members of the Catholic Church, membership, think of the word member, like you pay your dues and you're a member, you set the terms on your uh, watch, you know, membership, from membership to discipleship, to allow ourselves to be taught by Jesus Christ, the teacher, on a mission that began at our baptism and is reinitiated every single Eucharist that we celebrate. This relationship is huge. 
And so finally, at least of these slides then, the Eucharist is thus the source and summit not only of the church's life, but of her mission. An authentically Eucharistic church is a missionary church. We too must be able to tell our brothers and sisters with conviction that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you might have fellowship with us. Truly, nothing is more beautiful than to know Christ and to make him known to others. We cannot approach the Eucharistic table without being drawn into the mission, which beginning in the very heart of God is meant to reach all people. Missionary outreach is an essential part of the Eucharistic form of Christian life. Next, second story, second meditation. Back at Our Lady of Victory grade school in Cincinnati, we were concluding uh, what was 40 hours devotion. And on the last day of the 40 hours of devotion, I was charged with being the server that was responsible for lighting the candles and doing all of the other things that needed to be done for the conclusion of Eucharistic, uh, the 40 hours devotion. And I remember we had this amazing monstrance on the high altar. I mean, this thing was like six feet tall. It was so big, in fact, there was a small monstrance inside the big monstrance so it could be taken out and processed around. And I remember walking out of the sacristy, getting ready to light the candles on the back altar, and I, I caught the, the sight of, of, of an older woman I knew but didn't know that well, Mrs. La Rosa. And she was sitting there in the front pew in adoration. And I remember her face, it was, it was beaming, it was radiant. Her arms were lifted up to the, to the host. The smile on her face was something I hadn't quite seen before in this beautiful, tiny, wonderful woman in the front pew. And I, it wasn't lost on me. It touched me in some way. It just touched me as a little kid could be touched in that moment. And so I went, and I was lighting the candles, and I, and I heard a, a thud. And people were screaming. People were running over to Mrs. La Rosa to, to take care of her. She died. She died right there. And I remember thinking, as a little kid, whatever she saw, I want to see before I die. Whatever she saw, I want to see before I die. She was clearly enveloped in the mystery of God's love. We're all given that wonder in her eyes. And that awe, that wonder, that bedazzlement is an essential characteristic of what it means to be a Christian. In fact, my, one of my professors, uh, when I was working on my first master's at Xavier University, Dr. Brennan Hills, would often say, without awe, depth, and bedazzlement in our hearts, we miss the essential core of Christianity. Because it's linked to a mystery we can't fully understand. Wonder, awe, that God has become incarnate in Christ and in the risen Christ. The whole universe now throbs with that divine presence. And I can't help but think that maybe Brennan and Francis came together in some mysterious way when Francis said, when I speak of astonishment at the Paschal mystery, I do not at all intend to refer to it what at times seems to me to be a vague expression of sense of mystery, like it's a mystery to me. Sometimes this is among the presumed chief accusations against liturgical reform. It is said that the sense of mystery has been removed from the celebration. The astonishment or wonder of which I speak is not some sort of being overcome in the face of an obscure reality or a mysterious rite. It is, on the other hand, marveling at the fact that the salvific plan of God 
has been revealed in the paschal deed of Jesus. And the power of this paschal deed continues to reach us in the celebration of the mysteries of the sacraments. Because another way to describe sacrament or to translate it is a mystery. Know some of it, but not all of it. And I pray every day that the Holy Spirit will give me the eyes of Mrs. La Rosa so that I will perceive that is given to us in a substantial way in communion, that I will be given more and more throughout my life the eyes and the heart of astonishment, even in the small things. We certainly have the seven corporate sacraments of the church, but we also have 70 million other ways and ways that God communicates God's love to us in a very substantial way. I'm thinking of astonishment and mystery as I think about all of us gathered here for this talk, for this precious blood convocation in St. Louis, bringing together our priests and brothers and sisters and lay companions and friends, and the list goes on and on. It's astonishment and wonder. This isn't an accident. We're here because God wants us here. And it's good that we are together. Third and final story. My first year teaching high school, I was also going to be Dr. Brennan Hill's teaching assistant at Xavier. And I was going to be teaching for the first time courses, uh, a course in sacraments, both at the high school and the college level. A lot of my background back then was in scripture. So I remember I was at dinner with, with uh, Brennan and we were at an Italian restaurant. And uh, you know how they bring the bread and the oil and the wine, it was all there. And um, I remember saying to him, I said, you know, Brennan, I, I'm gonna have to teach the doctrine of the real presence to teenagers, to, to, to people who are just not too far from being teenagers. Uh, how do you suggest that I engage their imaginations? How do I get them to start thinking and being imaginative, for example, like Thomas Aquinas? How do I help them to be bedazzled, like Mrs. La Rosa? How do I speak to them of the riches of the divine presence that permeate the universe? He said, well, it's simple. I'm listening. And he picked up the loaf of bread, and he picked up the, the wine on the table, and he said, all right, Kevin, tell me, what do you see? What do you see? Tell me what you see. And I was not expecting that. I, I said, well, I, I, see, I see grapes. I, I see roundness. I see crust. Okay, all right, we're off to, can you do a little better than that? Can you use your imagination? What else do you see as you look at the bread and the wine? And so I, oh my, I said, well, well okay, I, I see wheat fields. I see the earth and the ground and the soil. I said, okay, good, keep going. What else do you see? I'm like, I said, well, I guess I, I, see, I see chickens because there's eggs in the bread. I, I see chickens. He said, oh, good, good. What else do you see? I see rain. I see sunshine. I hear my phone ringing as a sign that uh, brevity is the soul to clarity, just like Shakespeare said. Yeah, he said, yes. What else do you see in the bread? Well, I see yeast and cows and stardust because matter is not created nor destroyed. It just changes form. Yes, he said, yes. I, I see even the atoms of my dead relatives. He said, yes. What else do you see? What else do you see? I see, well, I see fire in the ovens. I think Nazi Germany, I see my dead relatives, the mouths of the poor. I see those who have Thanksgiving meals with families that talk and families that don't talk. It's all in the bread. He said, yes, yes, what else do you see? And I went on for a while talking about the grapes and the fermentation and all of that. And after a while, he said, good. And there was this pregnant pause. And he said, now over all of that, he said, hold that all together in your heart. 
And over all of that, the church prays, this is my body. This is my body. The whole cosmos is there. That when we eat, we become one with him because we are symbiotic with what we eat. You know, an old woman, an older woman who says about her grandkids, I can just eat him up. Eat him up because she loved him so much. Hold all of this in your heart, and over all of this, the church prays, this is my body. And I have used this ever since with students of all ages, and very few forget it. Some of them even start to weep the more we talk about what's meaningful to them in that bread, and over all of that, Jesus validates it and transforms it into his very, very self. Requires a kind of wonder, a kind of bedazzlement, a kind of astonishment, just like Mrs. LaRosa had. And it's all about transformation, if you think about it. Those questions, what do you perceive? What do you see? What do you notice? Because any way you look at it, Jesus is kind of the theological optometrist who helps us to see things differently if we allow ourselves to see differently by Christ who helps us to see. It's a powerful, powerful line as I bring closure to this talk that when we think about Eucharist, the substantial conversion of bread and wine into his body and blood introduces within creation the principle of a radical change a sort of nuclear fission, to use an image familiar to us today, which penetrates to the heart of all being, a change meant to set off a process which transforms reality, a process leading ultimately to the transformation of the entire world, to the point where God will be in all. St. Gasper, St. Maria de Matias, all of our powerful holy women and men in this room and beyond, I think have encountered the one God living and true in the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and resonate with that deep, powerfully transformative potential in the great sacrament of God's love. Because Eucharist is a process, sacred of transformation, whereby it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives within us. Third story, final story. But since you've been such a good audience, bonus story, (laughs) bonus. I was giving a talk at St. Paul Church in Valparaiso, Indiana many, many years ago I was getting ready before the talk, setting things up in the church, and there was a wonderful, wonderful older woman praying, kind of like where Mrs. LaRosa was. And she came over to me and she said, are you the priest? She was, I guess, coming to the talk and I was wearing my clerics. I said, yep, I'm the priest. Oh, what are you gonna talk about? Uh, Reconciliation and forgiveness. So that's what they told me. I said, oh, are you any good? <laughs> I said, ma'am, I'm going to do the best I can. And she took her finger, her index finger, got right up, right up here. And I was thinking of the movie E.T., you know, <laughs> waiting for the tip to turn red. And she said, Father, To do the best you can, that's what the saints are made of. You can't swallow it whole, but we did the best we could. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift that calls us to be bedazzled, to be amazed, to be be completely caught off guard by the mystery of God's love. 
to be the best you can, to be bedazzled, to be surprised, and to be astonished, even at the moment of our death. Until God is in all, and the nuclear fission of Christ's paschal mystery transforms us. Do the best we can. And after not a lot of caffeine, I've done the best I can. Thank you and God bless. I think we just have a few minutes left. Not that we have to do any question and answer, but if you do have any question and answer, questions or answers, feel free. All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody. If you'd like to chat after, I'll be around for a little while. Oh, I'm sorry. We have breaking news. <laughs> That's a really good question. Yes. Uh, in fact, I, t I sure can repeat the question. She asked about Eucharistic miracles and their validity. And, um, and, and there are. In fact, one of my students, it's kind of a long story, did a, an independent study on uh, verifiable Eucharistic miracles that the church has investigated and approved uh, from both the body and the blood. And there are certainly instances where that has happened. Yes. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. She asked about some parishes might use the, the wafers, others might use bread. I knew a parish years ago who would use Hawaiian bread, which is very delicious. They, people were coming left and right to get that bread. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. There you go, there you go. Um, I, I'm probably not the best to comment on the particulars. There's others who could, but I, I know at least we use the uh, unleavened bread, which is, is the wafers. That's normative in our tradition. Um, bread that isn't unleavened technically is not sanctioned by the church. It's preferred that it's used. And some, of course, have celiac disease or related conditions. And so uh, they would request a, a low gluten-free host. As I understand it, it's impossible to have a, a, no, a non gluten-free, so they're all low gluten-free, but according to the doctors, the low gluten probably would not, you know, hurt someone who had a gluten-related issue. And in the alcohol, or in the, the, the wine, the precious blood, there does have to be a certain percentage that is alcohol. Yeah. Anyone else? Yep, sure. Right, maybe, maybe a, a Eucharistic aha moment in, 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 in the life of, of one of my students. Well, I, I think one thing last year, uh, a, a, a young man, I don't think, he, he was not in a good place and really didn't believe that anyone loved him, let alone liked him, whether it was his family or friends, many of whom did, but he wasn't, for whatever reason, able to receive that love at that time. He didn't have the capacity. And he went on one of our retreats where he heard 
from his family and friends and, and his small group in very tangible ways how much they really did love him, not just in written form, but in spoken form and with their presence. And at some point um, after mass, he had kind of a breakdown, but it really wasn't a bad breakdown. He broke down all of those walls and said, I finally can experience the love of God in a real kind of way. And he said, that must be what Eucharist is like. It's not just a, it's not just a symbol. It's not pro forma. It's really a substantial communication of that which is real. And when it's that real, it can change hearts because my heart was changed. No, thank you. It's a good question. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Again, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, yes, Father Seraphim. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. If somebody doesn't believe, how do you, how do you try to make some inroads? I think one thing is, is to be able to set up in clear terms just what we believe about the, about the real presence, because sometimes I've heard people describe it as, as more of a consubstantial reality, where some of it is the body or some of it's the blood and the other half isn't. So to be very clear about what the church teaches and why it teaches it. But then I think is to invite folks to have an experience of God's love through the Eucharist, and maybe even walk them through how they could engage a little more meaningfully, meaningfully with the love of God for them in that moment, what that might look like. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, Aquinas would talk about analogical thinking. You know, it could start with think about someone in your life who you know loves you uh, uh, tremendously, and spend some time in that moment reflecting on that very real love and the very real presence that they either brought to your life or bring to your life now and be in touch with that. And then imagine that Eucharistic Christ is there inviting you to experience love even more without any fear, frustration, loneliness, anxiety, reservation to really give yourself permission into that divine abandonment of God's radical love in the vortex of the Eucharist and see where that goes. Uh, it's not going to be going from you know, zero to 60, but growth is slow often, but it's still growth into that love nonetheless. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think of that? What, do, do you have a, another suggestion? Because it's a great question, and I certainly don't have all the answers. Yeah, right, exactly. Right, and Father Mark, thank you for that. And I would also add that, that the young people I teach, they're not, thank God, many of them cynical and sarcastic or, or what have you, or jaded, but they're overwhelmed with the technology. It's kind of hard to dream and be imaginative when you're so linearly locked into this. And I'm not blaming that on all of our woes. I'm not, because there's a lot of blessings that come with being connected. But at the same time, it can also disconnect from some of the things that, that really matter. Yes. That's right. Yes, the, that powerful invitation. I, I've also seen this uh, on what are called Damascus retreats. The, there's a big retreat center in Michigan and Ohio that does Damascus. And they set up uh, Eucharistic prayers like Eucharistic adoration, and they do it really well. And um, I can tell you the number of students I've seen who have had these tremendous breakthroughs into the love of God in that devotion that has continued beyond that retreat. Some things that we've continued at McNick even afterward that have brought students and continue to nurture that love uh, that they're getting from God and that they're trying to translate into their own lives has been, been very, very powerful. And to your point, Father Mark, it's, it's about that invitation to come and see. Come and see. Anyone else?
Oh, see, there we go. I, I was feeling it. Yeah, it's a complicated question. It's a good question. Um, I think what you get to is this, this very real idea that God is always greater than our conception of God. God is always greater than our ideas of God. God is always greater than how our heart understands God. God is always greater and inviting people into that wonder, astonishment, and reality that the Eucharist pushes us to reimagine at every Mass. So, so thank you for asking that. Our time has concluded. Again, thank you all for coming, and God bless.